I gotta tell you guys about a few new products over at our favorite CBD store. That's of course, PalomaVerdeCBD.com. The first thing I'm gonna tell you about that's brand new over there is these THCV gummies. There's 10 milligrams of THCV per gummy and 10 gummies per jar. A lot of y'all are probably familiar with this THCV. Some people call it diet weed. It's very good for intermittent fasters. THCV helps suppress or dull your appetite, which of course, a little bit unlike regular THC that as you probably know, or at least you've heard, can give you the munchies. THCV helps promote energy unlike regular THC, which of course makes you feel kind of mellow. This is legal, oh my God, legal under the Farm Bill. So thank you, Farm Bill. The second thing I wanna tell you about that's new over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com is their full spectrum nano CBD soft gels. These have the perfect amount of CBD with THC. 25 milligrams of CBD and 0.27 milligrams of THC per soft gel. Their everyday formula brings your body back to homeostasis and adds this nice extra layer of chill. I like that. I think you do too. A lot of us need that now and again, or maybe every day. Nanotechnology allows better absorption into your body even better than their other products, which was already amazing. Again, this has a calming effect and it lasts about six to eight hours. And of course, like the other stuff, it's legal under what? The Farm Bill. Thank you, Farm Bill. It's legal. I would not get you guys in trouble. Go over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com. They've got a lot of great products. I talk about them all the time. The massage oil. They've got the sleep bundle. They got nano CBD soft gels, CBD bath bombs, which are amazing. Gummies, tinctures, all of that stuff. Of course, for my French bulldog, Lux and George, the pet tinctures and the pet gummies. All of these things are over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Oh yeah, did I tell you about the cool menthol sports cream? Of course I have before. It's the best sports cream in the world. I get reviews from customers on this all the time. That's the number one thing I like from this company. And they've got all of these great things. Over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com, you will get a promo code because Carlos and Vanessa, the owners, love this show and they want to help out the listeners of this show. Promo code BUCK at checkout gets you 20% off of your order over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Promo code BUCK at checkout gets you 20% off of your order. Go give them business and in turn, give me business. Now, let's get back to the show. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast. A place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, cause I call the hologram brass. But I am the center inside the placenta of mass. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Great to have you riding with us this week. This one's a little bit different, but not too much. So I've got Texas Slim on from the Beef Initiative. And I really appreciate what they do at the Beef Initiative. And I think this is really important, more important than some of the other stuff we talk about, to be quite honest. And I thought, will the audience understand or get into discussing food and beef and meat on the show and wait till you hear this interview. This is really good. It's interesting because the take he has on what's happened with the beef industry and what's happening with farming and ranching and our food supply, it really does tie in to a lot of the things we already talk about on this show. And so I think you guys are going to love this episode with Mr. Texas Slim. So he's he's the head guy over at the Beef Initiative and the description of the Beef Initiative, I'll read here for you. The Beef Initiative is a trade group focused on decentralizing and making our food supply more localized, redundant, and secure, and improving the quality of our food through pure animal protein and sound money, which is a critical input to achieving food security. See there, I know there's already some buzzwords you heard in there that make you perk up. So I'll just get into this interview right now. My guest on Counterflow this week. Texas Slim, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing good, Bob. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I think you're in, down there in central South Texas, and I'm up here in the panhandle of Texas. <laughs> so good to be on here, man. I'm in Lockhart, the barbecue capital. Yes. Love it. I was just there last week. So, nice. uh, okay. Yeah, we've got, some, uh, we've got some things happening down in your parts about well, to good. transpire. Yes. Good. 
we we could use that, I, I think. Let me, I'll get you, you've never been on here, of course. I'll get you to give you an intro, whatever intro you'd like to kind of, uh, that you find pertinent for my audience to know. And then we'll dive sure. into the Beef Initiative and, and all things. There's a lot going on with you. I love it. So I'll let you have the floor for the moment. Well, uh, you know, I, I dove into something about three years ago. I come from Austin as far as my adult professional career, but I grew up in agriculture and ranching. That's all I know when I was growing up. That's what my grandfathers came from and everything. About 20 years ago, I, uh, I started diving into a, a level of food intelligence. I think a lot of people really need these days within our uh, structure in the food supply systems. And, you know, we started un uncovering. I was a research analyst in big tech for years. And so I got a pretty good set of uh, skills to where I can kind of dive deeper than most people can as far as the, the available information out there. And what I found was basically I called, uh, I wrote a, a paper and it was called The Harvest of Deception. And it was a look at our basically where we came from and where we have gotten in, in the, let's say since 1900, but really since 1971. And uh, I was able to reflect a lot about my, my grandfather, uh, the land that he owned, and I helped steward as a child and how things have changed. And what I found out is basically whenever we were started monocropping in the 70s, really, whenever Eric Butts, uh, the Nixon administration said, we're going to go big or go home. We've been on a trajectory of uh, a metabolical bankruptcy in this country, and it's catching up with us. And uh, you know, what I did is I went around the country. I embedded myself in a harvest company. Uh, I know agriculture. So I really did some deep, deep research. And what I found is pretty scary. There's a lot of things that are coming our way that a lot of the general public doesn't understand. And that led into the beef initiative. And what that was is, you know, I grew up with a freezer full of beef. I grew up in Texas. And I've always been extremely pretty healthy, except some, you know, injuries that I've had. And, and basically, I knew that we had to get back to what the source of the seed of where we came from, what food was, and basically what the source of the seed of a solution is. And I feel that the Beef Initiative is that for a lot of different people. So, well, let me ask you, before we get to the Beef Initiative, you, you threw in 1971 as, as kind of a, a, a tide change. And a lot of my listeners will understand why that year specifically. Yeah. But for those who don't, can you mention that really quick? Well, that's whenever we, we went off the gold standard. So we started debasing the U.S. dollar. And whenever we debased the U.S. dollar by going off a gold standard, something that was of sound money at the time, you can follow a lot of things in our, in our country and across the world that got debased along with our dollar. And if you follow our food supply, that's when we started really generating a lot of fake commodities and started injecting them into that, our food system. And, you know, and they started with seed oils, you know, they started with high fructose corn syrup. There's been so many things that they've been able to inject into our food systems that are fake commodities that are subsidized by the U.S. government that devalues our food and our nutrition as it devalues our health in the long term. And I think that we're really starting to see that. And I, I believe that COVID really kind of shined a lot, uh, a light on a lot of this to a lot of people as far as the weak dollar and now our weak food supply system, as far as the nutritional values of it. Mm -hmm. And there's been these, well, we'll get into these weird happening, these weird events at certain processing plants and at, later on in this uh, interview. But I want to sure. get uh, you to explain to my audience what the Beef Initiative is, what you guys do. Um, are there other companies like you, where you're located, uh, all of these kind of things. You bet. Well, the Beef Initiative is basically what we've done. I told everybody we're going to go out there and shake uh, the rancher's hand across the United States of America. And that's what I've been doing for a year now. I've been driving around the country, establishing relationships with the ranchers and the animal producers that want to feed us. But they are basically in a form of regulatory capture because of the processing centers. The four multinational processing centers basically control 80% of our animal protein supply in the United States. And they are about as corrupt as they get. And that's something they, they can't hide anymore. But again, the general public doesn't have a lot of access to that information. And so we bring a lot of education within the beef industry in the United States 
we're educating people and we're providing market access to these ranchers that have been cut off from the general public due to distribution restrictions, regulatory capture, you know, just name a few of being, you know, being caught up by the grain and chemical companies too, as far as what we're injecting into our cattle. So you have, you know, the commodity cow, there's so much the general public doesn't understand because our labeling laws are so corrupt as well that even good intentional people are going out there and they're usually probably eating foreign beef and they're thinking they're eating beef from the United States. And so what we do is we uncover the deceptions and now we have uh, we have many partnerships with a lot of ranchers across the United States where you can go to the beef initiative and you can basically digitally shake that rancher's hand if you are not able to go out there and have a peer-to-peer relationship with somebody that's local with you in your community. We're bringing the community to you and we're letting everybody know that, you know, this is the pure, the best pure animal protein that you can get because the United States still produces the best cattle and the best beef in the world, but we're not getting to consume that beef anymore. It's being sold overseas to the highest bidders mm. by these multinational products processing centers. And so what we're doing is we're giving the consumer like you or anybody else market access to to some of the best beef in the United States. And basically right now, I was talking to you earlier, we're just now about to open up a processing plant. Our partner is, that's KNC Cattle, Cole Bolton of Hometown Meats right there, Lily. Yeah. So about 12 miles from you. Yeah. They might, they might do some here at our farmer's market. I can't remember if that's them or not, but there's a local uh, ranch basically that sells their their beef here in Lockhart every weekend. Sure. Uh, I, I I think some of the you know you said eighty percent of the the meat is is, mm-hmm. is controlled by four companies. Are they in America? Or are they outside of America? Well, they're located in the United States, and that's how they get this regulatory capture. What okay. you have you have you have JBS, you have Cargill, you have National, and you have Tyson. So I'll give an example of JBS because they're pretty nefarious. They have been from the very beginning. Their owner was imprisoned in Brazil. That's where they headquarter out, but they created their corporation in Manhattan in an apartment complex. Okay. And so they know how to play the play the, you know, the the game, I guess you'd like to say. You know, they've got tons of money. But what they, you know, what they are is they have a lot of the processing plants that we used to have in our communities, these microprocessing plants, kind of like what Coal and KNC and Hometown Meats are building right there in Luling. We used to have one of those in every county in the state of Texas. Mm-hmm. And we used to feed our community first, and then it expanded out like that. What these major processing centers uh, have done, the multinationals, they've taken all of our great cows and they process them they take them from the rancher and then they basically turn them into fat cows and then they sell it on the global market they don't give market access to the local communities of where that beef is coming from and a lot of people don't understand that so they are in the united states they do control most of our processing and what you'll have in i call it the brazilian cattle drive you'll have cattle that'll start in south america down in Brazil, let's say, starts off as being a great cattle. By the time it makes it up to the United States through Mexico and everything, it's fed a lot of these commodities as far as, you know, the the shots, antibiotics, the steroids, the grains, everything that the chemical and the grain companies feed it. It'll cross the border into the United States. It'll be harvested somewhere south of San Antonio, and then it'll say USDA choice or prime, Mm-hmm. But it was never raised or stirred in the United States. It was just slaughtered in the United States. And then the, and the American public thinks it's eating Texas beef. It's not. What happens to the beef that's actually being raised in Texas, it gets basically uh, processed into same processing centers, sold overseas to the highest bidders like China, Japan, South Korea, Europe. And so we don't have that market access anymore. It's been a gradual thing that has happened, but now it is, is picking up steam. And we're basically, if people don't start waking up, we've lost over 40% of our ranch land and of our ranchers in the last 10 to 15 years. And the average age age of American rancher right now is 63. So we're not having the type of education that the younger generation needs. And we're not having the type of education that the general public needs. And if we don't watch out, we will not be eating American beef anymore. And they have a plan to turn 
American beef and Western beef and caviar to price us out of it. And then they're, they're, they're injecting a new fake commodity into the food system, like I spoke of before. And that's all the fake meat that you're seeing. The bugs, the, you know, the 3D printed meat, the stem yeah. cell meat, beyond meat. All those are uh, basically apparatuses that have been um, financed by the global food multinational corporations. The same corporations that are processing our beef now have invested in and are designing processing plants that take the soil and the animal out of the processing centers. And so what we're doing in the general public, it has a hard time kind of understanding this. We're going through a global industrial food shift across the world right now. And what it is, is because our food is getting so debased that they're going to keep on making their yields and their profits, but they're going to go ahead and take animal protein out of our dietary systems because I already have, and a lot of people don't realize it. You know, you have your soy-based products, all this that they put into all the heavily processed foods for children, pizza pockets, chicken tendies. A lot of that is not real meat, but they don't have to tell you that anymore because they do have control of basically, you know, manipulating and influencing the FDA and the USDA when it comes to labeling the laws. A lot of people don't even read the labels anymore anyways. They just see heart healthy or they'll say 14 grams of protein, but it yeah. won't, you know, they don't see the protein that's in that. Or keto, you know, I've noticed well, they, yeah. they, they throw that on a lot of things now. Yeah, they do. Are, are these ranchers in Texas and, and all around, I suppose, but I'm used to the stuff here here locally. Are they, sure. trying, are they trying to, do they realize what you're saying? Are they trying to get out of a certain system and into a different system and, and do something more locally? What are, What's the mindset of a lot of the ones you talk to? Well, you know, it's across the board, right? And it, it's tough to generalize because when we say ranchers, you know, it's very broad. We have our sure. Harvey ranchers, your big ranchers. You have the commodity cowboys, you know, that in the Texas Panhandle, that's where a lot of commodities are basically distributed it, you know, just because it's the Great Plains and that's how cows are raised here because they've monocropped most of the soil. But if you look at a, a, a vast majority of them, they would love to be able to have and, and steer that cow all the way through until it reached your fork. Mm -hmm. They would love that, to be able to sell it to you directly. That's what's, you know, that's what a lot of people bottleneck are those processing centers. But it's also being um, kind of, I'd say, captured by the grain and chemical companies. You know, they have to follow protocols to be able to get their beef processed through these multinational processing centers. It's not that they're doing this on purpose. They do what they have to do by U.S. rule and regulations yeah. by the USDA. If we had more processing centers, you bet, more ranchers would quit the protocol of the United States government and they would do their more of a regenerative protocol that has less input. And if they, they had that, that market access to that processing center, they could build out a better revenue model to be a rancher from where we used to come from. Mm -hmm. We used to steward that cattle all the way from the soil to your fork. And that's where they made their money. They didn't have to worry about passing it on to a corporation and only taking a small cut of that profit. Basically, during COVID, uh, the American rancher was shut out about $280 million worth of profit as that same company, JBS, made $500 million in profit. And then they settled out of court for $56 million for price manipulation during COVID. You know, everybody doesn't understand the circus that is being played, you know, on the regulatory side of yeah. our food supply. And so you bet that they, the ranchers would love to have free market access through a processing center, kind of like what Cole is doing in Luling. And once they have that, man, they're going to, I think there'll be a snowball effect. We already have five new producers coming through the processing center that have contacted us. So much, so very often, uh, your average person hears regulation and they think, well, the regulations are there to make sure that these companies don't poison my food. But it sounds like um, a, a lot of time with regulation, even car, car companies and in the industry, many industries, the big rich companies want the regulations and they'll, they'll lobby Congress for them because sure. it, it, it forces the smaller companies to either go out of business because they can't afford to abide by them or basically conform and then they'll get bought out. Is that kind of what's happening with this, the beef yeah. industry? Yeah, that's what's happened in the beef industry. You just nailed it. 
it's that simple. You, you know, once you can have lobbyists and you can have multinational type of capital expenditures yeah. and you have connections in Washington, D.C., it doesn't matter. You know, you, you can get anything overturned. You can, you can settle out of court and act like, hey, we're the bad guy. We settled out of court. But really, you're making $500 million worth of profit, but you only got fined $56 million. Yeah. And whenever the general public, you know, they don't have time to have to pick all this apart. You know, they need somebody like me that's really, you know, is trying to save the American rancher, give American rancher the voice that he deserves and the voice that was stolen from him. And we, we're doing it. We're having massive success. And, you know, when I started the beef niche, everybody said, well, is this just a Texas thing? And I was like, no, this is across the United States. But now this is turning into pretty global. Uh, I'm traveling overseas. I'll be going to Australia late January 2023. We're having a couple of summits there. I had three uh, summits in the uh, United States. I had one in Texas, Colorado, and Georgia so far this year. We're going to have a big old feast, a cattleman's feast down there in Luling, Texas. And this is a, it's be our fifth one. It's a big celebration. It's on November 5th. You got to be there. Cool. It is, it's called the Cattleman's Kill It and Grill It. And we're going to give a processing plant tour. We're going to give a ranch tour. And then we're going to have a big old cattleman's feast. And we're going <laughs> to, it's, it's, it's affordable. It's 49 bucks, all the steak you can eat, two tours. It's just a good old networking celebration event. And so I, I encourage everybody to try to get there if you can. Is there, uh, do you ever talk about the difference between grain fed and grass fed in your, in your work? You bet. Uh, okay. Can you, can you kind of touch oh, yeah. on that really quick? You bet. Well, a lot of people will get confused and it is confusing, but once you have cow, all cows start off on grass. They're all grass fed when they first start off. You know, a commodity system that we have now, they'll take them off of pasture grazing and all that, and they'll basically go into a feedlot system. That's when they're fed grains. And then they get fatter, they get bigger, and then they basically get slaughtered at the heaviest weight that they can get, making, once again, a lot of profit for these multinational corporations because they're the ones feeding the grain. Then you have, you have grass-fed and grass finished yeah. where you have regenerative ranchers that'll go out there and steward and do rotational grazing with their land that they have. And you can basically finish a cow on grass and not have to feed it any grains. Okay. That's one side of the spectrum where you have the factory farming to the feedlots will finish off with these multinational grain companies, that type of grain. But you also have people like Cole Bolton and a lot of ranchers that will finish off with grain because of a taste profile, but it's a it's an organic grain. It's a locally sourced grain. Okay. And so you're going to have three different spectrums there, really, that you want to look at. A grass finished cow is going to have a lot leaner meat to it. It's not going to have that much fat, right? It's going to be a lot leaner, and the you know the nutritional value is going to be solid most of the time. Sometimes you're going to have to worry about leaner meat and a leaner cow. And sometimes, like this year, we had a drought in Texas, right? And it hit us pretty hard. Well, a lot of people were taking these small cows to slaughter that probably didn't have any, you know, business being slaughtered at a low weight. Then you have people like Cole Bolton, where he'll finish off with organic grain to get that fat content, to get that taste profile into what people are more used to that they want to adopt. It's still just as healthy. Some people say grass finished is a little bit more healthy and everybody's going to argue that, which it's, you know, I, I don't go that far into it. I'm not a nutritionist, but, and then you got, of course, the, uh, the commodity cow and that's, yeah. that cow is going to be, you know, a, usually what the general public's eating and you can't compare. You can't compare from a grass finished or organic organic grain finished. Once you have this type of beef, you don't go back. Okay. You will quit going to the supermarket. And, you know, we've been doing this for about, I guess, close to about nah, 10 months now by selling beef through the beef initiative. I have not had one complaint in those 10 months about the taste profiles are our beef and it's amazing how much word of mouth we've spread and how we've grown just by that word of mouth do you deal with uh, ranchers that do raw milk at all i haven't you know okay. uh, where i've been i know some guys that are you know we're getting there texas is tough you know yeah. for the raw milk that's what i've heard very restrictive right now and so we're really wanting to take a look at it 
we have some connections with the Farm and Ranch Freedom Alliance. There's been some things, there have been some fines that were given out to a couple of places in Texas, but more and more people are starting to pay attention to raw milk. And I think that, you know, the lobbyists, there's some fights that are going on. I think it's going to lean into the favor of the raw milk production for a lot of local communities. And that's what we're kind of looking at right now. You mentioned, you, I, I see this on your site, I've heard it in interviews, and you just mentioned it earlier, regenerative uh, ranchers, regenerative farming. Can you explain what that is for people that heard that word? And what is that? Sure. Well, it's really kind of how we got here. You know, you let's look at the state of Texas. You know, state of Texas created the cattle drive. State of Texas fed a nation at one time with our cattle. And we spread out all through the United States with cattle drives, through rail cars. Just, you know, we, we, we fed a nation. Around 1878, we started feeding that nation. Well, that was regenerative farming and ranching. What they did is open range. You know, they let the cows basically really grow soil or graze off the soil in which they stood on. And you hear in modern times, you have the same thing. It's just not a cattle drive. You have something called rotational grazing. A rancher will put out, you know, let's say, 100 cattle on a section of land. Those cattle will go down there. We call them the land tools. They'll, they'll basically consume that, cat, uh, that grass down to a certain level. And then they'll basically um, move those cattle with that rotational grazing. What that rancher is doing, he's regrowing that soil using the land tools to basically graze off of that grass. That soil gets stronger. You know, you have this climate thing that's going on, the cows a carbon hazard. Mm. That is the biggest propaganda going on in the world right now. The cow is the best thing that we can have. Basically, for carbon suspension, they regrow soil. Carbon lays and stays in the soil. Whenever you monocrop and you till land every year, you're basically releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Whenever you let land tools regrow soil on grasslands, you're basically eliminating the carbon out of the atmosphere. This is what people need to wake up to because this climate change this is part of the industrial food shift. It's the distraction. And we need to get back to the basics of what regenerative farming and ranching is. And it's regrowing soil, using the land tools to regrow the soil, not damage the soil with chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, but use those land tools to actually make our, our grasslands, our, our, our soil healthy again, like it once was. You have a lot of people that they grew up, their ancestors or genetic farmers and ranchers. Will Harris of White Oak Pastures in Georgia. That's where we just had our last summit. His grandfather, his great grandfather was a regenerative rancher. His father was a commodity cowboy. Mm -hmm. He was a commodity cowboy and he woke up one day and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And he went back and did exactly like his great great grandfathers had taught his whole family. And so he did from regenerative farming and ranching to commodity, which involves, you know, the grains, the chemicals, everything it takes to grow uh, grass, uh, feed, grain for those cows. And he eliminated, eliminated that out of his protocol and he was pulled back into regenerative farming and ranching. I want to talk about, uh, I guess, some nefarious aspects of, of, of some of the stuff that you know about. Sure. What's 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 some of the what are some of the goals of some of these transnational corporations? Because we hear it's almost a meme at this point: eat the bugs, live in the pod, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But that's based on something. And I've heard of you mentioned three D printed meat and cricket protein. And one of the things that scares me, I learned this quite well over twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, is if they can package the one of something that leads them to their end game and in a, in a mirage of safety and we're doing it for you, people, yeah. people will do it and they can, they, you know, they use this, the, the threat of, of the coof and to get people to ask to stay home and, and literally sit on their couch and do nothing yeah. while uh, mega corporations got very rich and very powerful off of this. So there's obviously, even if it's not, a few people can pulling the strings at the top. They can lay out incentives for big companies to go, well, I, I would like to do this. And then incentives for the regular average person to kind of 
take the medicine they're <laughs> they're given, so to speak. What's, yeah. What are some of the goals with the, on the evil side of this with, with these big corporations and, and the lack of meat, the food wars, all of this kind of thing? Sure. Well, if you look at it, I always call the medical pharmaceutical agricultural complex, you know, impact. And what you've had within all of those corporations, multinational corporations through the mid-90s when we really kind of adopted NAFTA, you've had four major consolidations of food companies and grain companies. The last big one was in 2017, 2018. That's when Bayer bought Monsanto and, you know, made a big consolidation on the chemical and grain side. And then you had the multinational food corporations really combined. And, you know, Warren Buffett was all part of that. You had all, you know, PepsiCo, all those guys. What they're really doing, and they have no bones about it, they want to create a one world food group. They want to basically eliminate more options for the general public and for the communities and get into a more of a one world food supply system to where they can control and they basically are the stewards of your nutrition. They're the stewards of your energy. They're the stewards of the guidelines. And whenever you do that, it's nothing new in history of, of humanity. You've always had, you know, power positions and power players basically nutritionally starve the people. And and a lot of people can't wrap their mind around that. But right now, we are overfed and nutritionally starved in the United States. Our metabolic health proves that. And where we have is, we have a country now is metabolically bankrupt. 78% of us right now in the United States are either obese or overweight. One out of two is either diabetic or going towards diabetes. Five to 11-year-olds in the United States right now, especially after COVID, 46% of them are now overweight and obese, and one out of two is either diabetic or to diabetes. This is a freaking epidemic of proportions that people can't wrap their head around because we're nutritionally starved and we want that comfort. We want to be told, stay home. And so if you can control the, control the nutritional supply to people's brains, then you're going to be able to make them basically lose personal space. It's a prohibition against us. COVID proved that. You bring up, you know, people would want to stay on their, you know, in their living rooms and sit on their couch. They already did studies before COVID. They know people don't even take vacations anymore. They just change living rooms. (laughs) They're told when to eat, told when to line up, and they get, you know, cable TV wherever they are. So, yeah, there's something big going on here. And it's always about sanitation. You know, it's always keeping you safe. It's always based on fear. And people need to wake up. But one thing that we have right now is food has been turned into a drug. I work with over 10 to 15 doctors. I get reports from them of what they're seeing in their doctor's offices as far as the inflammation of people's brains, the the fatty liver disease that uh, small children are coming in with caused by highly processed food, which would be the oils, the fructose, corn syrups, all the sweeteners, everything that we're feeding our general public right now is killing us. And, you you know, you can go into conspiracy theories or whatever you want, but whenever you have basically the pharmaceutical industries talking to your agricultural industries and the pharmaceutical industries are supplying the insulin and the agricultural departments are supplying the poison, <laughs> They are in cahoots with each other on a level that people do not understand. This is not a conspiracy. This is happening. People need to wake the hell up because it's coming. And that global industrial food shift is coming. And there's a sense of complacency in this country right now that's been developed by a, a yearning for convenience. Yes. And, you know, the, the convenience store has now been turned into the supermarket. Yeah. And the supermarket is now the old convenience store. And people need to understand that labeling laws are corrupt. Our nutritional value has decreased as a nation. It's the worst it's ever been. And if we do not change our consumer demand to more pure animal protein and better nutrition and clean produce, you will get captured by this because everybody thinks it tastes good. So they're going to eat it and they're going to see something that says heart healthy. Whenever you have something on a canola canola oil, which is rapeseed, which was outlawed by the FDA in 1956, and it says heart healthy, you know the labeling laws are (laughs) bullshit, basically. 
you know, and it's it's something that the general public needs to basically develop a new level of food intelligence. I mean, that's what we're looking at here, because what what we've been depending on the institutions, the academia has gotten us where we are. We're basically like I keep on saying metabolically bankrupt. Mm-hmm. Is there a thing about I was speaking with a friend yesterday and he, he said uh, this seems like common sense. You have to have animal protein and fat for a healthy brain function. And so yes. naturally, there's a reason why the powers that be might want to take that away from people. Yeah. Well, that goes all the way back with Ansel Keys. And, you know, your listeners, just do a search on Ansel Keys and the Ansel Keys cholesterol deception. And you yeah. can even find, don't use Google, use something like Duck Duck. But you had the, you had the conspiracy on cholesterol, which most of our brain is made up out of cholesterol that's basically generated from animal protein. What happened is we had animals and we had fire. Once we did that, we our brains got bigger, our stomachs got smaller, and we evolved into the species that we came from. They're taking a lot of that logic and a lot of that history out of a lot of people's understanding of what true food is. So animal protein, animal fats is the best thing in the world for your heart, for your brain, Everything that's going on, and if you look at our ancestors, you look at my family, where my grandfather, where he came from, you want to talk about a picture of health. Well, what changed right then? 1971 changed, yeah. and we debased the American dollar. We debased our food supply, and we, we basically have gotten here over 50 years, and it, this is where we are, though. Oftentimes, the the goal of people that I don't like that I think have malicious intent is to <laughs> centralize control high up over lots of people. Um, let's get into the Bitcoin aspect of what you do because a lot sure. of what you do is preach decentralization of, of, of the food system. Also, of course, people that are aware of Bitcoin is a decentralized method of, of, of money, essentially. So can you talk about what you guys do with Bitcoin? Sure. A lot of people's understanding of Bitcoin is off because, you know, the education is not there. There's a lot, you know, crypto, cryptocurrency, crypto coins. That's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin's not crypto. For one, that's what a lot of people need to go in whenever I speak about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a store of value. And w- how we use it within the uh, beef initiative and within cattle ranching, it's a store of value that our grandfathers had that our modern day rancher doesn't have anymore. And so it's a peer-to-peer transactional system that nobody can take it away from you. It's uh, inflation, It's basically inflation proofs in the long run. It's a store of value that you can rely on better than the United States dollar in our current system. And so whenever you incorporate Bitcoin into your economic structure as a cattle rancher or as a consumer, you have peer-to-peer transactions. You don't have to have permission. You have no middlemen. You have no banks. And so at the Beef Initiative, you can go and have beef delivered to your door. You can do a peer-to-peer transaction with that rancher. doesn't go through any banks. It's completely legal. And I guarantee you it's something that's going to, whenever we have some more, I guess, <laughs> the monetary system right now is taking a hit across the globe. If, if, we, if we have a crash or something like that, people are going to understand that Bitcoin is basically that peer-to-peer transactional system that you, you need. The truckers, you know, in Canada, if they would have been set up with yeah. Bitcoin, that would have never been confiscated. But all yeah. of that money was confiscated from them. You can't do that with Bitcoin. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I've been preaching on here for because a lot of people in Texas, and I've said this throughout the years, or worried that someone like Beto O'Rourke is going to come around and take their guns. And after uh, what what happened in Canada, I thought they don't need to take anyone's guns. They can shut your bank down and then you yeah. can't do anything. <laughs> so, I mean, they you can bet. shut you off from buying guns at this point, um, but not with Bitcoin, like you said. Sure. What's going on? You're the first person I've had on to, I'm able to ask this to, and maybe you know, maybe you don't, but what in the world is going on with these food processing plants blowing up, catching fire? Now, I don't know if this was a social media thing where that this has happened in the past, but now they're reporting it more or it is something nefarious and it is happening more and more. What the, what the heck's going on with this? Well, there's a lot of processing plants that have blown up and caught, caught on fire. And to give 
you know, not to generalize too much, but if you've ever been in a processing plant, uh, it's full of high-pressured gas, high-pressured air. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in one of those processing centers. But so that, we went through COVID and, you know, a lot of people quit working. So they kind of use the angle that, you know, these processing centers have become unsafe because they didn't have the type of quality employees that they once had. So you hear a lot of excuses, a lot of reasoning. What I do know, though, and this is part of a global industrial food shift, is that they're about to start building a lot of new processing centers across the world that do not include animal protein. Uh, and so what I think, and this is my observation, and I've got pretty deep, I've got pretty good reporting on this. My observation is that what they're going to do is start building these processing centers that mostly process these fake meat products. And they're going to tell people that they're basically designing new and safer processing centers from the ground up to keep us safe and healthy. And they're going to be more automated. They're going to be more digitized. And they're going to basically start digitizing food in a way people don't know. Has somebody gone out there and been an arsonist on these 28 processing centers this last year? Who knows? Is it possible? You're damn right. Is the time right for people to be worried about that? Hell yes. <laughs> Where the nefarious action happens, I'm not for sure. But I know what is nefarious is that they're changing our food system in ways that people don't understand, and they involve new processing centers. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most responsible way to look at it. Sure. It looks like there's some incentives there for certain people. You bet. Um you mentioned it earlier. I want to just hit on it one more time. The global warming thing, climate change, as they call it now, that seems to me to be the next big psyop. It it's, it's, they've laid the groundwork since I was a kid with Al Gore and all of this stuff. And once again, they can position themselves as as almost saviors. And we're saving the, you know, what's bigger than the planet? What's more important than this? And there's a way to usher in all of this reset stuff through global warming. I've suspect that there's a possibility we'll have global warming lockdowns again at some point. Um, can you just um, talk really quickly again about what to watch out for and why this is this is something that they're trying to use? Well, they're going towards carbon credits and they're going to, they're basically going to track and trace you in a way that a lot of people don't understand that they already had the capability of doing. It's kind of the ESG uh, yeah. model that they're doing. And what they do yeah. is, you know, in China, they have a social credit score. Well, they're going to start being able to do that within the United States based, uh, based on your consumption model. Your consumption model being food, of course, how you travel. You know, everything that you touch is going to have a, a credit score on it, a carbon score on it. You buy an airline ticket right now, they're already doing it. Using 16% less emissions, you get credit. And so what they're going to do is they'll start labeling you as what type of consumer you are, what type of credit you can get. And it's a new form of, of basically keeping you in a box and keeping you sequestered in a way that the general public doesn't understand. And by saying this is based on saving the planet, we've got to save, you know, the rainforest. You know, you have all the billionaires buying up all the farmland in the United States. Yeah, yeah. They don't want us to have access to basically our ways and means of, of the past and they want to say that it's because of climate change. I grew up with, uh, we were going to have the ice age in the 70s. That was the big 70s psyop. And then it, now it's global warming. And most people, their consumption model on audio and video is the mainstream news. And if you're still watching that stuff, man, I, I just I, I bless your heart because it, it's propaganda. This ain't happening. This, we're not going through global warming. You can find just as much information that counterpunches all of their argument. But if it's not on freaking CNN, people say that it's not real. But, you know, we know CNN. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> But what, what they're doing is they're basically a form of prohibition against you from your consumerism to your diet or to your you know nutritional delivery. They'll be able to grade you on your consumption models. And what I see moving forward with this climate change, it's part of something, you know, it's a human capital bond market that they're creating. Because we're so bad, because I come from big tech, I was in telecommunications, I was a research analyst there, I had access to a lot of things. What they're doing right now with the human capital bond market, just to make it 
simple. It's a form of hedge fund. And so they're going to start betting on our health. And they're going to know what type of health we have by our consumption models. They can break it down now. You know, they know where you shop. They know what you eat. And, you know, they're going to be able to give you those type of scores. And then they'll tag in the carbon credits and, the, you know, you're a bad consumer. And they'll start developing these type of marketing campaigns saying you're a good consumer, you're saving the planet. But what you're really doing when it comes to the food side is you're nutritionally starving yourself mm -hmm. because you're not getting the right nutrition. And we already know that that's happening. You have so many multinational corporations like, yeah, so like Royal DSM. They're out of the Netherlands and they design and they basically have learned how to hijack our taste buds. They basically made $9 billion in revenue during COVID. And so they're moving forward hard. There's a lot of things. They're part of this climate change narrative. And you look at what happened in the Netherlands as far as the farmers in the Netherlands. Yeah. Okay. That's a land grab and it's going to happen. What they think is that they don't need that land anymore because they're going to take the soil and the animal out of the food delivery systems, and they're going to basically digitize and, and basically um, highly processed food that will be in warehouses. It, we will not see food made the same way that it has in the past. That's their goal. But what we can stop it. We can slow it down by our consumer demand. If we quit validating all these deceptions and we start going out there and shaking rancher's hand, developing relationships with somebody like the Beef Initiative, where you know exactly where your food is coming from, they have to pay attention. And that's what, you know, the growth that we're having is phenomenal. People are discovering us through a grassroots, you know, type of way. You know, that's why I drive around the country creating all these relationships across the United States. Do you think there's some bad times ahead as far as, well, any yeah. of this kind of stuff where uh, I fear because th a lot of times they can't get to the part where they're offering you safety and, and security unless something b bad happens. Yeah. So what yeah. do you see? What, what do you think is coming? If I, I said this last year in November. I said, I think they're going to fabricate a, a short-term food supply uh, shortage. And I think that will probably happen within the next six months, especially us going into winter pretty soon. You'll see some stuff happen over in Europe because of the lack of energy. We have a fertilizer shortage. We have a grain shortage. We have an energy shortage now. Well, if you don't have grain, you don't have energy, you don't have fertilizer, you don't have food. And so what I think that we're going to do is you, anytime you have a pandemic, you also have a famine and you also have mass migration. No matter what you look at history, that's going to happen, and I believe it's going to be happening in the end of 2022 and 2023. Uh, <clears throat> I have a freezer full of beef in several places. I recommend everybody do that where you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. You can secure your food supply now. It's not a, a big alarmist, but it doesn't take long for uh, supermarkets to clear out. And I think a lot of people discovered that in Texas during that freeze, you know, right. the winter before last. And so, you know, I... Who's to say how bad it's going to be? But what they'll probably do is they'll fabricate a food supply shortage because of our food supply line, you know, our chains, everything on a global level have been hit. Uh, I think a lot of that was done on purpose so they can basically get into this one world food group. And once they do that, they'll introduce a new fake commodity into our food systems and say, hey, we're the saviors. We're going to take care of you. And but a lot of people won't realize what has left our food and what has been embedded in our food at that time. Mm -hmm. What, uh, before we get you out of here, what, I guess, advice, helpful tips, things that if, if someone hears this and they're like, well, shit, Texas Slim, I do believe something bad could be coming. I'm interested in what you guys do. What do I need to avoid? What should I kind of look into? I, I'm looking to, to secure my family's future and, and, don't, and I don't want them starving. I don't want people attacking us, of course, and stealing right. our food, but what should we do? What, what we've been doing with the Beef Initiative, and we got to get back to, you know, whenever they said we got to feed the world back in 1971, that was propaganda. We never fed the damn world. And if we did feed parts of the world, we quit feeding our communities. And so the best solution that you can have right now, and, I, and this is, you know, across the United States, we've got our cities, everything. If you can go out there and shake a rancher's hand, go do it right now. Be part of this movement. 
develop some relationships with those people that are trying to feed you. Be a farmer's market, be you going out there and finding them on a dirt road. It does not matter. If you cannot do that, become part of the Beef Initiative. Come, come join our Substack. It's my Substack is TexasSlim.substack.com. Go to the Beef Initiative. Source your food from a different way. Do not rely on the supermarket to be your form of food and your nutritional delivery to your family. It's not just overnight. It takes a little time. It takes some relationship building. But let's get back to the source of the seed of where we came from. We can do it. Many people, thousands of people are doing this right now. And there's plenty of momentum. There's plenty of education. We've got over 80 producers in the Beef Initiative that have added themselves into the Beef Initiative so people can find them. So across the United States, more producers and ranchers are adding their information. Sometimes it's just a phone number and where they're located. And they're receiving calls from people looking to source. The number one thing that you need for sound nutritional uh, life right now is pure animal protein. Get as close to that source of protein that you can get. Develop a relationship and, and store up. Get, get a half a cow. Get a quarter of a cow. Whatever it is, but get your market access to food that is not basically being sold to you and propagandized by these multinational corporations. That's the smartest thing you can do, and it's 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 a, it's a lifestyle change. I call yeah. everybody. I tell everybody that the beef initiative is an international lifestyle. You just don't understand it yet, <laughs> but people are starting to get in because once you start changing your consumption model, you get healthier. You get happier. Your mind clears up. There's so many things. It's not. It's not like going on a, a diet program. This is not what right. this is about. This is a lifestyle change that you are yearning for. You just don't know that you're yearning for it yet. The amount of quality people that you meet, the amount of education that you receive that is not propagandized is amazing. And I hear that. I get emails, tens and twenties of emails a day. You know. Children's lives are changing. Families are changing. People are developing new relationships with animal producers, ranchers, restaurants with locally produced food just because of the beef initiative. This is a big movement. It's going to get bigger. And, you know, it takes action, but it's actually pretty fun. I mean, it is, it, it's a good change. Mm-hmm. Well put. Plug away. It's uh, a good pivot. It's a good pivot. Um, plug websites. Yeah, you, definitely. We, we got the Substack. Uh, I'm going to link to that. But plug any any place where people can find you uh, that you'd like. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, uh, beefinitiative.com is a, is a great help. But I'd like to, you know, subscribe to that newsletter. That's important because we're going to be really bringing a lot of information through that. Uh, I have a podcast. It's called Texas Slim's Vision. And, you know, we have a lot of different podcasts on there. For ranchers, you can see what the ranchers are saying. Uh, Will Harris is on there. People like Adam Curry's on there. Uh, so that's a great place. And then I only use Twitter. It's uh, My Twitter handle is at Modern T Man. And I try to keep it as simple as that. So, you know, uh, this is not a marketing plan. You know, this, right, is, this right. is not, I'm not an influencer. And so <laughs> what we're doing, we're very intentional here. And, you know, we want people to change their lives. We want people to really get what they're looking for. And I, I believe right now, especially after that damn marketing plan uh, from that virus, people are ready for a new lifestyle. I and think this so. is very empowering. Yes. It's very empowering to do. So, Excellent. Texas Slim, thank you for being here on Counterflow. Hey, Buck, I appreciate you, man. And, and best luck. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're going to see you and everybody there in Lockhart. About 12 miles south on November 5th, right? Yes. That's a kill it and grill it, I think. Something like that. Yeah, yes. it is. Go, uh, go to BeefInitiative.com and it'll say upcoming events and just click on that button. Tickets are only $49 a person. That's pretty cheap. That's cheaper yeah. than a steak dinner in a restaurant that's oh, feeding yeah. you uh, commodity beef. Yes. So. Awesome. Come check Thank us out. Will do. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you, Buck. Take care. Beefinitiative.com is the website. Texas Slim is the main man over there. I think after this interview, I have a feeling many of you are going to go check out that website, beefinitiative.com. And uh, what a great interview. What a cool guy Texas Slim was on and off the air. I love when I get guests, and that's most of them, to be quite honest, that don't put on 
some type of spiel when I hit record. They're the same on air as they are off air. And Texas Slim was just that. Thank you guys for tuning in. Of course, you know, for this show, counterflowpodcast.com. You can find me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. And if you ever feel the need to contribute to this show so I can keep this wonderful production going that I've got, it's at patreon.com slash counterflow. If you feel that this show provides you some value, you can give any amount you want at patreon.com slash counterflow. It will all go right back into this production of this show. I promise you that. And until next week, we already got another one. We have another great one already in the books for next week. Let me see any hints. We're going to talk geopolitics. We're going to talk Russia, Ukraine, America, Israel, Europe. How's that sound? I'm not going to tell you who the guest is, but this will be the first time that he's on the show solo. Maybe there's a hint for you. All right. Until next week, y'all have a good one. See ya. You get split in fucking half. Cause I call him the hologram brass. But I am the center inside the placenta of mass. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.